Hello, I'm Eric Bustos, the board chair of the Future Forum. Welcome and thank you for joining our annual discussion on women in leadership. In LBJ's words, we are the doers of today and the builders of tomorrow. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to have informed and bipartisan conversations about the issues affecting us today. Our events are made possible though by our members and sponsors. So if you're not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up and learn more at lbjfutureforum.org. This fall, we'll have even more virtual programming and we look forward to sharing more about those events soon. But during today's program, we'll hear from five women and how they are leading through the pandemic and what they've learned during this time. I'm Raven Douglas. I am the political director at Move Texas. Um, and I, I, right now, there's definitely, this is a new, normal, and unprecedented time. Um, but I'm really doing my best to kind of just roll with the punches, um, try to find the best out of each day, um, and continue to move forward. In our team, we've always kind of worked remotely. We have team members in San Antonio and Dallas and Austin, I'm um, in Houston. And so kind of our face-to-face -face interaction hasn't necessarily changed. But um, one of the things that we have kind of set up at MOVE is that, you know, we're not just working from home, but we're trying to work in the middle of a global pandemic um, and being very sensitive to that. And so um, if a team member needs an extra day, we give it to them. If they just need to talk through things, we've created spaces for that. Hi, my name is Emily Ramshaw. I'm the co-founder and CEO of The 19th, a nonprofit newsroom at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. Uh, we are launching The 19th this summer in the midst of both a global pandemic and what I hope is a modern day civil rights movement. Uh, it has been extraordinarily difficult for a whole wide range of reasons, trying to get a brand new venture off the ground, hiring most of your staff via Zoom, navigating this really sort of tough uh, politics and policy really human moment, uh, truly across the interwebs. Um, so it's been an extraordinary time, an enormous challenge for a lot of us. My day-to-day -day right now looks like the life of anyone who's trying to launch a startup with a four-year-old at home with no childcare. So uh, <laughs> I am uh, navigating, you know, parenting and trying to keep a kid away from me with a stiff arm when I'm on the phone or on the Zoom with donors or, uh, you know, journalists on our team. Um, I'm navigating the sort of rigmarole of getting a kid into some kind of uh, childcare setting while I'm uh, running to one of my colleagues' houses to sort of quarantine with her as we work to launch this venture. You know, I'm spending a ton of time navigating um, relationships and uh, progress on our team um, via Zoom, really, via uh, conversations on video conference, um, you know, ensuring that everybody is managing this moment as best they can, looking at mock-ups of our new website, of our newsletter via shared screens, um, you know, really trying to, to navigate all of this in a highly unusual <laughs> screen-focused lifestyle. Hi, my name is Kate Garza, and I am the Director of Advocacy and External Affairs at Ascension Seton and Ascension Providence. And in the middle of the pandemic, um, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, but also see it as a great opportunity to step up to the challenge and an opportunity to serve our community. Every single day um, is a new challenge and opportunity. A key component of my job is problem solving. And so our Ascension mission calls on us to commit to serving all people with special attention to the poor and the vulnerable and to be advocates for a more compassionate and just society. I see each day as an opportunity to put our mission into action through service, through connecting people to resources and identifying opportunities for advocacy on behalf of our healthcare system and also our community. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was identifying resources that we needed in our hospitals and seeing if they were available in the community. Um, it's also been helping the many, many generous members of our community who wanted to donate items and meals for our healthcare heroes in the hospitals. And then also a big part of my job is advocating for legislative and regulatory changes that help our healthcare heroes do their jobs every day and do them safely. Hi, my name is Karen Reynas. I'm the Executive Director for NAMI Central Texas. 
And in the midst of everything going on these days and the impact of the pandemic, I'm think I'm like a lot of folks where life is sort of this roller coaster. I think um, certainly there are good days and then there are days that are a little more challenging. One of the things that um, I recognize is that a lot of people are talking about mental health in a far more proactive and positive way than I've ever seen before. Um, people that ordinarily might not talk about mental health are talking about it. And because of the nature of the work that I do, um, I see this great opportunity to provide some new um, programming and opportunities for education and support for people in this time that's really critical. I'm Nicole Conley. I'm the Chief of Business and Operations for the Austin Independent School District. Um, of course, I'm feeling with living in a state of flux with tons of uncertainty, um, it, it has a lot of us um, feeling angst about the future and what school looks like. So we're in a sort of constant state of planning for the unknown, um, contingencies on top of contingencies, um, at the same time trying to be a, a mom and homeschool while I'm working on Zoom um, you know, up to 16 hours a day. So a little overwhelmed. Um, uncertainty about the future, but very confident in our ability to deliver what's needed for our students and families in Austin. I have two middle school um, boys, and so in between those days, I'm checking on my kids, making sure that they're following up on their um, instruction, their online instruction. Um, they're running in and out of the kitchen for food every day. The, you know, early on in COVID, my office was in the kitchen, so we could all kind of work together, and I didn't have to be too far away from them to make sure that they were doing their online instruction. You know, I try to get up during um, during the Zooms because otherwise you're sitting all day. They always say, and now they say, sort of sitting is the new smoking. Um, so it's been difficult to maintain um, healthy habits, quite frankly, unless you're sort of consciously doing so. So. My day, unfortunately, is end-to-end -end Zoom meetings, trying to navigate online instruction for my kiddos in between, um, and just trying to stand up every now and then. Now I've learned how to sort of take those coffee breaks on Zooms. I will say that my team, I feel like we feel more close than ever because we're kind of all in the same environment, um, going through the same things. Um, but we have really allowed space in the organization to give time as people have needed it. And so um, I really see my role, I think a big part of a leader is being a supporter. Um, and so I've really tapped into that characteristic um, in my leadership to really ensure that my team has the things that they need, not only professionally, but also you know personally and mentally as well. I think most days I'm just barely keeping the wheels on, honestly. I mean, I, you know, look, when I left the Texas Tribune in January to launch this new venture, uh, I already was pretty risk averse. It was a huge leap for me. And the reality that I've now taken this leap into an enormous unknown uh, in the midst of a pandemic where nothing is the way it was before and all of the projections we had for what our revenue would look like, what our audience might look like, every Everything has shifted in the span of a few short months. So I am extremely lucky to have support systems. I'm extremely lucky to have a husband who is an engaged dad and can divide the time with me. Uh, my parents live in Austin, Texas, so they can share the time. My sister and brother-in-law are here to help. Uh, you know, all of us are really just piecing this together. All of us have day jobs. We spend a lot of time trading spaces. Um, and you know, beyond just the basics of childcare, which is an enormous responsibility in the midst of trying to, you know, keep your income coming in the door. Uh, we're navigating the emotional stressors that play a role in this. I mean, it's it, it, these are four-year-olds and five-year-olds who are asking questions about germs and when they're going to be able to see their friends and when they're going to be able to go back to the park. And I think, you know, the emotional toll, the psychological toll this pandemic is taking uh, on all of us, including the littlest among us, um, is, is an enormous responsibility we're shouldering right now, in addition to just trying to keep the wheels on in our own professional lives. I'm not going to be shy. I'm going to be honest and say that it's, it's really tough to manage. It's a lot of different um, things to worry about. If I wasn't worried before just about the district's finances, now I've got to worry about health conditions and safety and, um, you know, um, pandemic effects. And so um, I think what allows me to 
sort of, you know, not, you know, you know, work and thrive in this kind of condition is the fact that there are some silver linings, there's some bright spots. It's made me realize that um, it's created innovation in my team, like we're doing work differently. We're, we're utilizing technology and tools that we probably would have never accessed before. So we're doing a lot more check-ins with each other. We're you know trying to do sort of care and center support. Um, we're trying to avail more health services, online or not, to our staff so that they can sort of talk through these things. So I, you know, I feel like our level of caring and responsiveness to each other, that social and emotional support is really um, brightened and, and sort of it's beaming throughout this whole tr trauma of going through this pandemic. From other people, I think sincerely, the thing that I hear most frequently is just the immense amount of gratitude from the community for the really hard job our healthcare heroes have to do. There are so many people who want to help, you know, whether it's providing resources and PPE or meals um, or um, helping families find childcare. It's been really incredible to see the diverse ways in which people are stepping up to say, can we please help? The other thing that I hear from people in the healthcare community is that there, things are changing really, really fast. You know, there's a lack of information out there and what you know today may be different this afternoon or tomorrow. And so how important it is that people have access to good information, that they know that the healthcare system is safe, that if they need care, that they're going and they're getting it when they, they need, and that they're not afraid to access care. I participate in the Council of Great City Schools, so I'm conferring with superintendents and um, CFOs from um, Miami-Dade, um, New York, LA, all of us are sort of trying to um, muddle through um, the effects of the pandemic, no, you know, not only just operationally in our schools in terms of what is school going to look like going forward, um, but the financial impact that it's had on the entire economy. We have to be more conscious about um, our decisions because we serve such a diverse range of students, economically, racially diverse, um, diversity in religion and languages. Um, so for us, we just can't make these unilateral decisions because we have a much more heterogeneous student population and family population. And you know, like Austin and like many districts across the state, Austin is the feeding program for our community. We know that our, sometimes our kids have to come to school to get meals, so we've sustained our school feeding program throughout the entire pandemic. Um, we serve families, adults, and other, other non-ISD students during this time. Other districts are, feel the same pressures. Um, we're probably the largest food chain in the city of Austin right now. Um, without our support and supporting our community in this way, um, we, we, we wouldn't our students and families wouldn't have secured meals. And so we're offering meals, we're delivering hardware and Wi-Fi to, our, to students to make sure that they ha can access online instruction. You would be surprised the lack of internet access across many of these urban centers. Um, you just you sort of take it for granted that it exists. And so that can compromise students' abilities to access the learning. And we know that the most disproportionately uh, the students that are most disadvantaged are going to be the most disproportionately affected. And so we're worrying about that. And also being sort of an economic center, we're the largest employer in Austin. Um, many of our school district counterparts are the, they're in urban cities and they're large employers. But the employ our private entities and businesses are waiting for us to make the call because parents need childcare. And so businesses don't even know if they can operate with, you know, with their employees because they're grappling with the childcare issue. Is school going to open? So there's these enormous pressures like economic, you know, providing childcare, making sure students don't ex continue to experience trauma. I'm worried about kids that are probably at home by themselves, right? Because if there's no childcare, there's no schools. 
what we are hearing across the state from young people is one, um, there's kind of a lot of uncertainty around what's happening with school. Um, so whether it's high school or a vocational school or a university, um, young people don't know where they're gonna be on November 3rd and they don't know um, where they're going to vote. So it's super critical that we are um, really strengthening our vote by mail process um, to ensure that those young people can vote if they're not in the county by which they're registered in um, or they're out of state um, because their campus is doing online classes. Um, and so Texas is only one of nine states that has not expanded vote by mail. Um, and those with those states, there are restrictions around vote by mail. And so we are going to be working um, with, you know, elected officials, young people and community partners to really see if we can expand that by November, um, because it, this is really a time where we should be trying to make voting as accessible and easy as possible. Um, while, you know, young people are worried about their job and the economy and their health um, and their school and their education, this is not a time where we should also be questioning our democracy. And so um, those are just kind of some of the things that we have been working on or are paying attention, paying attention to and what young people are telling us. One of the things that you're seeing is people, whether it's conscious or not, I think really creating the space for people to be vulnerable and open about what's really going on. Because I, I think so often, yes, we live in a culture in which somebody says, so how are you doing? And we say, oh, I'm fine. And, and I think we're doing more of that no, really, you know, what's going on, or sometimes we don't even have to ask. People will just say, actually, yesterday was a really rough day, but I feel better today. And, and I think the reason for that is that we are having this very unique experience. We all know that if somebody says, yeah, yesterday was a rough day, that chances are it has something related to the fact that we're in the midst of this pandemic. Maybe it is that someone that they love and care for has lost a job or is suddenly ill, or um, they're just super stressed because they're still working from home and feeling overwhelmed because the kids are in the other room and they don't feel like they're doing any of you know their roles very well they don't feel like they're really um, the uh, employee that they want to be and providing the kind of uh, work that they're accustomed to but they also don't feel like they're doing family life all that well and so we all understand that we're all navigating that I think this pandemic has uh, really put added pressure on managers to ensure you're doing uh, the human resources work you need to be doing to take good care of your team. And the reality is the colleagues on my team are grappling with so much more right now than just uh, trying to work and just you know getting their work product out the door. They are navigating small children with no childcare. They're navigating elderly parents who they're trying to keep healthy and out of the Costco so they don't get COVID. They are trying to navigate all of those additional challenges of working from home. But this moment is also exceedingly difficult for people who aren't navigating childcare, for people who live alone, for people who are managing the emotional toll of solitude. And so I think we have a responsibility as managers right now to be going the extra mile, to be ensuring we're taking care of the entire employee, not just focusing on the work product. We are trying to take care of the whole employee at the 19th by doing a whole lot of extra Zoom check-ins, by really requiring video FaceTime as much as we can uh, versus just being on the phone. Even if you're still in your pajamas and you've got your dog or your cat or your kid on your lap, that's just great. I was on a call with one of our colleagues a couple days ago and she was sitting on her kitchen floor uh, feeding her baby a bottle while we were having the work call and it was about the sweetest part of my day. Um, we are hosting you know, virtual happy hours every week where everybody comes and they bring their own coffee or their own cocktail and there's no work talk. It's just icebreakers. It's just the ability to sort of develop rapport and inside jokes uh, in a non-work setting. Um, so we are trying to go the extra mile right now, but I'd be lying if I said it was easy. Managing and leading during the pandemic has really clarified for me or highlighted for me how important communication is, how important clear expectations, communication about challenges, and regularly checking in with folks to see how they're doing. Um, you know, it, before the pandemic, those things were all really important, but I would see all of my team members on a daily basis. That's not true anymore. One of the things our team has done is we start every day by meeting on Zoom and checking in not only about how are we doing with our work, but also how are we doing as human beings? How do people need a little time off, a little break? 
Is there a project that they're working on that they need a little extra support? Um, our home lives are permeating our work lives in more obvious ways than ever before. And as a, a result, um, I think we celebrate, engage, and empathize more over little things than we ever did before. And in many ways, it's brought our own team closer together. Managing and leading during the pandemic um, requires me to be more thoughtful about both managing up to my leaders and my managers and managing the team that I'm a part of. Um, making sure that we are all working together um, towards the same common goal and asking for help or asking others if they need help more frequently. I think in my role as leader, one of the things that was really fundamental to me from the very beginning was to gather that team together and that's sort of what we did was we as soon as we knew that we were going to have to start working remotely you know we gathered together and what i said to the team at that time is um, this will be hard and there will be a lot of unknowns but we're going to get through this together um, and then as we made that transition to working remotely and again facing a lot of uncertainty one of the things that we made a priority for ourselves as a team was to really make sure that we were doing um, personal check-ins with each other and really creating that space for people to be vulnerable about the things that they're um, working through and dealing with whether it's work-related or personal and I think that that's really important because it's recognizing that um, we're people first before we're employees you know we're people who have our own needs challenges concerns and in order for our staff to really be able to function well and to be able to do the work that they need to do they have to be fully supported in who they are as people in their own human dignity i definitely think that the way that my management has shifted is doing some more check-ins you know understanding that um, there are some things that we're going to have to deprioritize and you know everyone's not working 60 hours a week anymore um, and that's okay and you know what does you know not everything is going to be five-star work all of the time but what are some requirements that need to be included in that and so I think that there's definitely been much more uh, communication, um, much more transparency, and also an emphasis on just because we're sitting at home doesn't mean that you can't take PTO. Um, and so I've required all of my team to take PTO before um, August comes and the election. Um, so, you know, it's really, it's really important and crucial to me that I'm supporting my team during this time. I think one of the things we have to recognize as leaders is that um, we have to walk the walk, right? I think um, I can talk about self-care and encourage that, but if I'm not doing it myself, then I haven't really modeled what it looks like. So I have to do that part myself. Um, I know for myself it meant I really did take, even though it felt at times like, is this the best time for me to be taking two weeks off? Um, and in spite of the fact that all I did was have a staycation because my, my vacation got canceled, I still, kind of pivoted and said, look, um, I was supposed to do this in June. I'm going to do this in July now. Um, and because I need that, I need to recharge my battery. We've been going and blowing quite a bit. Um, and so that's one of the ways that, um, that I have to do that is to model that and to some weeks say, Hey, you know what? It's been a really rough week. I've been putting in some long days Friday. I'm flexing my time and I'm just taking the afternoon off. Who else needs to do that? You know, and so really not just encouraging, but creating the space for it. I found the best way to sort of cope with um, COVID-19 is one, I look forward to my, I have a group of college friends and we have a virtual happy hour. And that virtual happy hour is something that I look forward to at the end of the week. Um, and then every day I spend at least 10 minutes just looking at myself in the mirror and, and naming everything that's great about me. You know, I had this tendency of like looking, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror, you say, oh, this could be done and I'm a little too chubby here. Oh, why was I so dumb? I didn't do that. Why didn't I think of it then? Um, I've totally tried to get into this discipline of looking at myself and saying everything that's right about me and everything that I did right um, and how I'm gonna do better the next day. So that 10 minute exercise along with my virtual happy hour has saved my bacon through this pandemic. 
I am a terrible coper, so I am probably the wrong person to ask about great strategies to calm yourself down. But uh, I think the one that's most effective for me, first off, is I truly get offline between 5 and 8 p.m. every single day and try to give my child that complete one-on-one, -on -one, two on one attention that she doesn't get the rest of the day when we're all distracted and scattered and leaning heavily on the iPad and the TV to get by. Um, I also, every single night, I, I try to stop the doom scrolling on Twitter that is a very common occurrence between 11 p.m. and midnight. And instead, I take a big sniff of some lavender and I do a crossword puzzle. That's my, that's my self-care. <laughs> the best thing that I have found to cope with everything is to try and spend a little bit of time outside every day, whether it's with my kids to play or to take a walk around the neighborhood after they're in bed. Um, we also started a garden at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I love that it kind of requires me to go outside every day to check and see how things are doing. My kids love to see the things that we're growing and to harvest the vegetables and things that we have out there. Um, and then it's also helped them eat things that I don't think they would have normally. My three-year-old now loves cherry tomatoes and I am not sure that ever would have happened before. I've tried a lot of different things. Um, so I've done painting and coloring books and um, things like that. But I think what has really worked for me the most is one, really keeping a schedule. Um, so, you know, going to bed at the same time every day, waking up at the same time, making sure I actually get dressed, um, making sure that I eat breakfast every morning. That has been super helpful for me. I mean, I've also got to say that I have been outside more um, in the past four months than I have ever been probably since I was a kid. And so it's been really great for me to rediscover, um, you know, the parks and trails that are here um, in Houston. And so that has been really, really great. And I hope to continue to do even after um, this pandemic. This is incredibly difficult, and it's hard for all of us for a variety of reasons. Whether you're like me and you're at home working full time um, with two little ones and, and everything seems to be a demand on your time and attention, um, or you're at home by yourself and you're not being able to socialize with your friends and families the way you did, you know, this is hard. Um, and we're all doing the very best that we can. So. Be kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. And then if you need help, ask for it. Um, somehow I think we've come to equate success and leadership with not needing anyone. But the reality is we all need help sometimes and really good leaders and managers know that and are willing to ask for help when they do. So ask for help, ask others if they need help and be kind. Sometimes it feels impossible to carve out space for ourselves. It seems like there isn't enough time or hours in the day to do the things that we need to do. I think it's important to figure out what works for you and your situation. For me, my kids rise with the sun every single morning. So getting up early really is not an option. That just means that I'm gonna plan on it, but it's not actually gonna happen. So what works for me is to find a little bit of time after I put my kids to bed um, and carve that out for myself. I find that if I'm not intentional about prioritizing that space for me, then all of the other things that I need to do take up all of that time, all of that space. So four nights a week, I can have a little bit of time to myself, whether that's taking a walk around the block or checking on my garden, um, or just tidying up you know, my space because that's what brings me joy. Um, and then I also try to be kind and give myself some grace if it doesn't work out. So some weeks I knock it out of the park and other weeks I can't make it happen and that's okay. I try and celebrate the nights that I do and recognize that I have tomorrow to try again. I wish I could say I'm finding time for myself right now, but I think one of the most difficult parts of this pandemic is that there truly is no time for yourself. There is, there is no retreat. There's no safe place to go. 
with a small child at home, it's truly even impossible to just close the door. Uh, you can't even go to the bathroom or take a shower by yourself. I can't remember the last time I took a shower without being interrupted. I can't even go to the gym. Um, so, I mean, I do think the overwhelming sentiment for me right now is the sort of inability to claim any kind of personal space. And I think um, for, for moms, for dads, for all parents, uh, that is probably the reoccurring theme you're gonna hear over and over again, no space. Sorry, that one wasn't good news. There's, I have no free time right now. <laughs> well, I think it is really challenging because as women, I think um, we often are right trying to do it all. Um, you know, we've got that cape on, and so we're trying to be really good and, and and really passionate about the work that we do, and then also balancing the family life and the personal life, and remembering birthdays and celebrations and all of those things. And so it is really hard because we put a lot of stress on ourselves. And I'm certainly guilty of that. And so to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I'm always doing that really well in terms of doing that self-care piece. Um, I really have to challenge myself to say, am I doing that? I will say that there are days when I find myself falling into bed and realizing that I gave 150% to everything around me and didn't do anything for myself. Um, and I try not to beat myself up about that, but rather say, okay, well, tomorrow's a new day. And, and I'll try to do that differently um, tomorrow. So I've found a lot of silver linings in this really terrible pandemic era that I really hope that we take forward with us into the post-pandemic era. I've learned that slow mornings and slow evenings with my toddler are about the best gift on earth, and I had truly missed those for the first few years of her life, uh, either because I was sitting in traffic or because I felt like I had to be in the office early or had to be in the office late. Not having that responsibility has created this whole gift of uh, uh, earned hours, earned time with my child. Um, I've learned how to slow down, honestly, I and mean, that's been a fascinating part of this transition is I'm someone who's just go, 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 and I'm always on, and I'm always, you know, giving that 110%, going 110 miles an hour. Being forced to go closer to 60 or 70 miles per hour um, is a real gift for those of us who've never experienced that before. You know, what I've kind of learned during this time that I definitely want to continue um, to, to keep with myself and continue to do as time moves forward as we move into this new normal. I think the first thing is definitely um, the importance of people. You know, you need people. And so whether that's your coworkers that you're leaning on or your parents or your partner um, or your friends, I think it's super important that we have community um, in some capacity in some way. And so during this time, um, I've built a lot of, um, you know, community circles and solidarity circles um, that I'm hoping to continue to um, keep and have. Um, I'm the mom of a six-year-old and a three-year-old, a wife. I work full-time. I'm very active in our community. Our lives are beautiful, full, and incredibly hectic. Um, what I noticed early on is that when things really started to unravel, it was usually because I was trying to do too many things at the same time. And I found I can do a better job at balancing all of those things. If I am at a good, safe, and steady place, I found that I'm much better at responding if I am grounded and steady and can take care of the other things that need my attention. So when things start to unravel, I try to stop and collect myself before I respond to any of the things that are asking for my attention. You know, whether that's five seconds, so I take a deep breath, collect my thoughts, mentally prioritize what are the things that I need to respond to right now. Or it may be I'm on a conference call and my three-year-old's crying and the five-year-old's running away with something. And I have to say, I need five minutes. I will call you back, get myself settled, take care of my children, then come back and deal with whatever it is that I'm doing. It's really about um, making sure that I'm at a good place and I know what I'm trying to accomplish and, and feel grounded in doing that. Um, the other thing that I've learned in responding to COVID is I can't be everywhere and do everything that I need to say no when I have a lot of competing demands. Um, so learning 
to say no, learning that I can't be everywhere and do everything and just accepting my own limitations has been a really important lesson of COVID. And I think it's something that I definitely want to take forward, even when we get back to our new normal, whatever that may look like. Well, there's a couple lessons that I want to sort of keep out of this new normal. One is all the notion of, you know, the whole notion of self-care and, um, you know, having that sort of emotional support and recognizing that as a need in our daily lives um, and making sure I share that, um, that, you know, share that opportunity and goal, create those opportunities and goals within my staff and my colleagues, right? Just the notion of that, that that has to be there, that it's not we're on working, grinding 24. When I was younger, it was like all about the grind, climbing to the top. No, no sleeping was for when you're dead. I mean, it's like, it was just constant grind. Uh, but now I really recognize the importance of like, that's not the key, that's not the answer. Um, I made a lot of sacrifices in that grind. It's really nice being home with my kids. I think those things that I'm gonna take with me, the appreciation for care, the appreciation for being around my family or just physically having my kids here, um, it's really good, it's really good. I complain about it, but honestly, um, I'm not a teacher. Online instruction has been difficult for me. Um, but to have the ability to connect with them at any point in the day, just to take a break, we kind of walk around the whip around the room sometimes just to get up from our Zoom um, screens. Um, but you know, the ability to have them near me has been a, a good relief, a good positive outcome with all this. Um, a lot of times I was a single mom and I was always worried about childcare and if my kids were safe while I'm at work for wee hours into the evening. Um, it's nice to have that relief of knowing that my kids are safe, they're here, and I can check on them. Um, but also nice to know that um, seeing in the insides of my, my colleagues and their, their love and care for their families and um, making sure that everybody's all right in the midst of all this. We've got business to do, but we can't do our business without each other. I think there's something about being confined to your home um, and having sort of a less sense of control over how what your day looks like has really forced me again to sort of be more in the moment and pay more attention when I'm talking to people and engaging with them and having a meal or whatever it is that I'm doing. I think because in many respects, my world has gotten a little smaller, you know, um, during this time, it's made me realize that so often I'm blowing and going and going 150 miles an hour and not taking that time to really appreciate and be focused on whatever is happening in the moment. Um, and I definitely want to keep that as I move forward. You know, I, I, I hope that that will be a lesson that um, will still stick with me, you know, hopefully a year from now when things are different. You know, that's my great hope, right? Um, that that will still, that will definitely stick with me. I think one of the other things that I've learned is I'm a much more flexible and resilient than I realized um, and that I am less in control of things than I actually thought. And I think that's important too, because I think so often the things that stress us out, at least for me anyway, is this notion that I can control things and that, um, and that in order for me to be successful, I've got to have control over many different things. And so one of the things that this experience has been like for me in the last few months is recognizing, oh, you know what, there's actually a lot of things I don't have control over and that's okay. Um, that the reality is the one thing that I consistently do have control of is how I respond to things. And that is the one thing that is always mine. We're all spending a lot of time together in close proximity, sometimes with just a few people. And we have to recognize that our friends and family and support system can't always be our therapist and how important it is for us to be comfortable reaching out and maybe talking to someone, a clinician, and how telehealth has really made that possible for me, more people to access that. So I think that's something to consider. And I think recognizing that sometimes for some people, therapy isn't enough. And we don't know until we reach out and ask, like, here's the experience that I'm having and I'm concerned 
concern. I don't know if therapy is enough. And really being able to be comfortable about recognizing, hey, you might actually also need to see your primary care physician and maybe potentially even need a referral to psychiatrist during this time. And that there's no shame in medication to address what is essentially a health issue. We wouldn't have any shame about using insulin for diabetes, nor should we have any shame in recognizing that, hey, I'm dealing with something that's more now clinical depression, and I might actually need not just therapy, but also an antidepressant to help me. Um, and so I think it's important that we create that space as well. And in the context of that, NAMI Central Texas is here for you with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we provide all kinds of great um, online free classes, support groups, education of all kinds. We're doing these amazing webinars twice a month that anybody can access. We have those recordings on our website so people can watch them actually on demand if they want. And then we are, I think, one of the best sources of information as well. So if you're just starting that journey and you're looking for resources and looking for information, you can just call us or email us or look at our website and we've got some great resources there and we can help you sort of navigate that as well. I think something that's really important to recognize right now is how privileged so many of us are to largely be inconvenienced in this moment instead of having to deal with serious illness and death, um, the challenges that so many people are enduring right now. So these are inconveniences and we're lucky in so many ways. Um, but I think, you know, from the standpoint of, of management in this moment, I do think we're at a turning point where we are truly learning for the first time just how challenging people's home lives can be and just how lacking our empathy for those circumstances was before. I'm thinking a lot about that, being able to see people's babies and their dogs and their home environments on the Zoom screen in the middle of the workday really opens your eyes to what folks are grappling with. And I hope in the post-pandemic era, we are all a little kinder, a little easier on each other and on ourselves. One of the big reasons that we're launching the 19th is to give women the kinds of flexibility and opportunity and benefits in the news business that allow them to advance to the highest levels of this industry. Um, so if, if those are things you care about, if those are values you share, we would love for you to follow along with us at 19thnews.org. Um, and so it's super crucial that we are participating in the process um, that passes laws and uh, elects re representatives that represent us and impact us every day, um, whether we vote or not. And so if we can have, you know, just 20% of young people um, show up and vote, it can completely change the landscape of who's representing us. Do they care about the issues that we care about? Um, and even when we talk about local elections, if you know, um, if you don't have a sidewalk on your street, if there are um, potholes on your street or um, there's a stop sign that was knocked over for months and has been put back up, those are your local elected officials um, that can really do that work. And so as we look towards November, not only is the presidential election important, but your railroad commissioner is important. And um, if you have city council members on your race, that's important. Your state representative, state senate. And so um, there's so much more than just, you know, the president that impacts your life every day. And so even when we look at um, what's happening with COVID and the pandemic, a lot of cities have been passing um, municipal funds in order to um, help with housing reimbursement and um, as well as, you know, um, utility reimbursement. And so um, those are the elected officials that you can vote in um, that can show up for you. Um, and so that's why it's super crucial to get registered and vote. And that's why, you know, organizations like Move Texas are here um, to really ensure that you can, that we make that process as easy and understandable as possible. And although it may seem like there are some barriers, um, we, there may just be a few more hoops that you have to jump through, but we can still get you registered to vote. Um, we can still help you turn out to vote. And so um, don't let your voice be unheard um, this election because it's going to be super, super critical. If you want to get registered to vote, you can go to movetexas.org slash register and check your voter registration um, status or complete a new application if you need to. Um, you know, we have um, a really great social media, um, so feel free to follow us on all platforms at move underscore Texas and visit our website at movetexas.org um, to stay up to date on the work that's happening and what we're doing. 
the thing that I would like to share with the community and leaders, um, just to really stay engaged, um, support the school district in its various endeavors because we do so much for our community. I, I feel like there people don't realize how much we do for our communities that goes beyond just providing an education. Um, we are providing mental health supports. We are offering sort of testing sites. We are the food pro feeding program in the city of Austin, trying to make sure families are fed. Um, we're putting, we have Wi-Fi on buses that are going to remote neighborhoods, trying to give opportunities for them to sort of get on the internet to, to find out what's happening and to try to access instruction. Someone has to do these things. And we know our students can't access curriculum if they're hungry or if they're dealing with trauma at home or they have mental health needs that they have no resources to, to satisfy, which is why we do all of these things. We have a crisis fund that we set up that we're you know continuing to feed adults and provide needs, um, you know, for our little sort of pre-K kiddos, we're trying to get them supplies and computers and we're doing the best we can. And just to know that we're just trying to make sure that our, our students, our teachers and staff um, are safe throughout all this and that we're able to um, serve our students to the best of our ability. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this annual discussion featuring women in leadership. This fall, we will have other great virtual programming and we look forward to sharing more about those events again with you soon. But in the meantime, I strongly encourage you once again to sign up and learn more at lbjfutureforum.org.